before you know we begin um, presenting Celeste Miss Ning, Miss Ng with the award, I'm just going to say a short few words um, about the Praises Elite and why um, Miss Ng has been nominated for the award. So the Law Society um, was founded in 1933 and for 88 years the Society has strived to provide its members with opportunities to socialise and um, to engage in discourse and of course to experience new phenomena. Um, the Praises Elite Award is an integral part of that endeavour. It is given to those who have left an indelible impact in their chosen field and who advance discourse and societal thought in the process. The award was founded by Mary Robinson, former auditor of the Law Society, and of course, the first female president of Ireland. Rarely bestowed, um, re previous recipients of this award include Gloria Allred, Sir Bob Geldof, Patrick Dempsey, and Samantha Power, to name but a few. This year, in particular, the Law Society wishes to place an emphasis on empowering students, not only in their everyday life, in their careers, but also in their everyday lives. And it is for this reason that Miss Celeste Ng has been nominated for the Praises Elite Award. Miss Ng is an internationally acclaimed, award-winning writer whose talent, honesty, and humility make her a role model. Her fiction and essays have appeared in the New York Times, The Guardian, and many other publications. She is a recipient of the Pushcart Prize, a fellowship from the National Endowment for the Arts, and is a Gaim Fellowship, among other honours. Apologies for my pronunciation. It's a little bit shaky. The phenomenon... I, I, that sounds so much nicer than it does in, in, you know, when we say it every year. <laughs> I don't know about that. Maybe that's because I'm pronouncing it wrong. <laughs> um, but the phenomenal success, Celeste, of your work has transcended to Hollywood screens as your most recent um, novel, Little Fires Everywhere, has been adapted as a limited series which I have greatly, greatly enjoyed. <laughs> um, Missing inspires crucial conversations about race, identity, and cultural discussions that have been invaluable to not only our members, but young people across the globe. It is our privilege to welcome Miss Ng to the Law Society today and to virtually present her with the Praises Elite Award. Thank you so much, Anne, and um, thank you so much to the Society for inviting me today. Um, I'm, I'm really very honored, and um, it's a thrill to get to talk with you, even, even virtually in this way. Um, I, I feel like I need to tell you that when I told my mother um, that you know, you, you, uh, you know, nominated me for this award and that I'd be speaking with you, she was so impressed and so thrilled. And then after a moment, she paused and looked at me with some concern and said they they know that you're not Irish right and I I assured her that that I was fairly sure this was the case but that's actually one of the reasons that I'm I'm really honored and delighted um, to to be here and talking with you today because when I started writing I wasn't actually sure if anyone would care about these books that I was writing about families who were living in small towns in Ohio, um, even families who were in small towns in Ohio. I didn't know if they would care about the stories that I was telling. And when readers find a connection and a resonance to my books, um, that's maybe the biggest gift that I feel like any writer can get, because it means that despite coming from a different country or a different background or a different experience that you're you're creating sort of a dialogue in your mind between yourself and these completely other people and for me that's one of the things that writing and particularly fiction can do better than anything else it can it can ask you to put yourself in the minds of some completely other person and to feel their feelings and think their thoughts and imagine what it might be like to be them. And whether or not you agree with what they think or what they do, I think that experience sort of enlarges us. Um, and when you find that resonance, it's something that then you can carry out and it echoes out into the rest of your life. And that's always what I try to do in my fiction. And it sounds like that's very much sort of what you're trying to do in law society of trying to get people to connect with each other and to talk and to think and to sort of broaden your experiences and, and find out what your power is that you can take out to make the world into a better place. So I'm going to keep this short because my favorite part, honestly, is the, the conversation. Um, but thank you so much. It's a huge honor and I'm very, very grateful.
<laughs> Thank you so much, Ms. Ng, for, you know, your um, lovely words. And I think you're so right, like being a writer, you really do get the opportunity to put yourself in another person's shoes and to see the world from their perspective. And that is something we try to do in the Law Society, broadening perspectives. Um, and it's something we'll talk about later on in the conversation, you know, how um, the universality of your, the themes that are ingrained in your novels and clearly that have resonated across young people and you know, people across the globe. So I look forward to speaking about that later on. Um, but before, you know, we talk about um, those issues, perhaps the best place to start is you know, to tell us a little bit about yourself and how was early life in Pennsylvania and Ohio? Yeah, um, I think I had a what I always thought of as a fairly typical and normal life. And of course, I think the older I get, the more I realize I, there is no re not really any such thing. Um, <laughs> I, I grew up in, in Pittsburgh uh, in what was a, a steel town, basically. Um, you know, there's a mill works and, and they were making steel. And um, my parents were both immigrants from Hong Kong. They moved to the United States in the 1960s and then they had my sister and they had me. So my sister and I had the slightly strange experience of being born in the United States, but being children of immigrants and living in a place where there were really very few other people of Asian descent. Um, in fact, the area that I grew up in uh, initially for the first 10 years of my life, I was very white. And so I stood out quite visibly. And you can look at all of my elementary school photos. And there's this one Asian face off in the corner because I was also very short um, <laughs> up at the front. And I realize now how much that experience shaped me of feeling on the inside like I was just like everybody else, you know, I had the same toys and we're going to the same school, we're learning the same things, we're listening to the same music. And yet also recognizing periodically that people would look at me from the outside and see me as somebody who is different, who didn't belong there or who was just maybe not from here. And I realized more and more that that's sort of the experience that I've had throughout my life. And it's one of the things that I, I carry into my writing. Um, when I got a little bit older, I moved to Cleveland, Ohio, which is one, one state over to the West, um, but very similar, very, you know, kind of uh, urban industrial, uh, we call the Rust Belt, because that's where they were building, you know, cars and steel and all that sort of stuff. So a lot of industry. And um, I had the, the good fortune to grow up in a town called Shaker Heights, which um, if you've read my, my second book, Little Fires, <laughs> is, is sort of like loving, I think lovingly portrayed in, in the book, um, which was a place that I think made me start to explore these issues. And you know, I'm sure we'll talk more about this as we go along, but um, it was a place where I started to really think about what my background had shaped me into and what I could do with that going forward, right? How did it make me different? And then what were other places where people might find resonance with that? Um, and so that's, that's, I think, how I got my start, honestly, as being a writer is feeling a little bit on the outside and sort of watching other people, watching what other people did and watching their reactions to me and just trying to figure out how people worked. That's, that's always how I, how I start my fiction. <laughs> Absolutely, by examining people and then Worth writing about it. So it is clear that you know, growing up in such you know a multicultural family and and I guess feeling different from a young age has really impacted um, your writings, which you know you can see um, throughout your novels. And um, so I guess you know, when did writing for you? When did you get I suppose the writing bug that writing <laughs> that you guys talk of um, contracting? Well, I, yeah, I, I can't remember a time when I didn't love reading and I didn't love writing and telling stories. I was a, a pretty precocious reader. My mother says that I started reading when I was two, but I honestly, I don't remember a time before I knew language. And for as long as I can remember as well, I've always been interested in telling stories, making things up. Uh, when I was a kid and I would go to visit my cousins, I would often write plays and then I would make them perform them with me. We would have, a, you know, our, our family come in as the audience and they all had to pay us, I think, 25 cents, something like that. And we would split the profits. But I was I was always the storyteller in the family. Um, so it's just my natural inclination. But for a long time, I didn't think that was something that people could do as a career. Um, I didn't know anyone who did that. My parents were both scientists. Um, we've got a lot of technical people in my family, engineers and you know, computer scientists. And writing to me seemed like something that you maybe did for fun. Yeah. You didn't get to do it as a job. Um, 
Exactly. It's a ho- it's a hobby. It would be like saying I'm going to be a a, a professional knitter, right? Or a professional, you know, like whittler. I'm going to whittle things. You know, <laughs> that would be my job. It, it just didn't seem like something that people could do. And so for the longest time, I I had this idea that I will have a real job, capital R, capital J, and I'll I'll write on the side. And so when I was five, my real job was going to be a paleontologist because somehow that seemed more uh, practical and attainable <laughs> than being a, a writer. And then I got a little bit older and I moved out of the dinosaur phase and I decided I would be an astronaut. Again, practical, attainable, everyday sort yeah. of thing. <laughs> and Exactly. <laughs> right on the side, right? You know, in, in between my, my trips to space. Of course. Um, Mars is like that long to get to. It's like, well, you've got a lot of time on the, you know, on the, the, the spaceship. You, you may as well be. be I heard writing upside down can really get, you know, your creative. Um... I was thinking that, right? Like, you know, you're upside down and, you know, blood is flowing. <laughs> and you've got a lot of time and you may as well be working on your novel as you go. Um, <laughs> exactly. So it, it took me a long time, I think, to start to think of writing as something that could belong to me, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Um, it wasn't really until I, I finished my undergraduate work and I went to work in publishing and I realized that that wasn't a very good fit for me. And I decided to go to graduate school. And at that time, I thought, well, I'll go and get a PhD in English literature and I'll teach English because that was my my major in, in college. And I, I love I love books, I love literature, I love reading. And I thought, well, I'll do that. And then I'll I'll write in my spare time. And I happen to have a um, I guess we call them the teaching fellows. So the the like kind of like they're grad students, but they teach a class and, and she'd become a mentor and a friend. And when I told her my plan, she said, What if you try putting the writing in front just for a little bit? And it it really is solely thanks to her that I even began to think this was a possibility. And she said, what if instead of getting a PhD, you go and get an MFA? And I said, what's an MFA? And, um, you know, she explained to me that this, you, know, you can actually, you can go to school for writing, um, which was sort of a revolutionary concept for me. <laughs> you, know, you could do that. Um, and so I applied to programs and I was fortunate enough to get to get into one. And that was, I think, the moment where I started moving from the path of writing on the side to actually maybe trying to make this the center part of my life. Prioritizing writing. Exactly. Um, I think it's something that, especially in creative fields, it feels like a big leap to do because you don't have a sort of job security, right? You don't, if you, if you go through medical school and you don't horribly mess up, mm-hmm. hopefully someone will be willing to hire you on the other end, right? To, to be a doctor, to treat patients. Um, you know, it's true of most professions. If you go through the training, there'll be some kind of job for you on the other end. And that's so not not true in in creative fields. You don't have any guarantee of success. And even if your work is good, there's no guarantee that you will, you know, it will find its audience. Um, and so I feel I feel very lucky that uh, that I was able to do that. That you took the leap. Because absolutely, I think from a young age, we're very much ingrained that we have to go to university to become something, you know. Yes. Where my parents always said, so and what do you want to be? They're like, you know, what course are you going to do to get this degree that will allow you? Um, so I think absolutely to take the jump and look at your prime a stellar example of how that um, the rewards that you can reap from, you know, going, I suppose, with your a gut instinct, would you say you had that you... I think so. I mean, I, I think that's the, the the nicer way to look at it. The the less nice or maybe more more brutally honest way is that <laughs> I I couldn't help it. It's almost like an addiction in some ways is that I would always be sitting there and writing stories in my mind. So if I was at my job and I I was bored in a meeting, I would sit there and I would look at the other people and I would start imagining what their lives might be like. Or I would think of something that I'd seen on the train or on the bus and and try and figure out what the story was. You know, for me, that's that's often how I approach a story is through a person, through something that I don't understand, or I think, why would they do that? Or what's happening there? How did we end up in this situation? And so a lot of my stories come from situations that I don't understand. 
and I'm trying to invent a story that will explain this to myself, right? Or if I meet someone that I don't understand or that just really puzzles me um, in a positive or negative way, I then start to think, how did you become that person? And what is it like to go through life in your shoes, right? You know, what was your what was your family life like? And how would you respond in these situations? And suddenly you're writing a story. And so I think, you know, it was a, a gut instinct, but it also was almost this sort of compulsion of imagining all these other people's lives. Um, I couldn't help it. And so in a way, I just had to kind of lean into that and decide, well, doing it anyway, I may as well, you know, try and <laughs> try and make the best of it. Absolutely. So it's fair to say that your stories, they're inspired by real people people that you encounter in your everyday life? I think they always start off that way. And then what I've always found too, is that, um, you know, most stories have a real life seed. Almost nothing comes totally made up out of, out of whole cloth, but they very quickly take on a life of their own and they very, very quickly move far away from the real life scenario, um, farther than I even, you know, could have expected that they would. So you know, to take an example, um, in my first novel, Everything I Never Told You, it's about a mixed race family. The father is Chinese American and the mother is white um, and they're living in a small town and they have three mixed children. And when the book begins, the middle child, uh, Lydia, who's 15, is, is missing. And we soon find out that she's drowned in the local lake. The root of the story comes from something real, but something very different, which is that um, my friend, uh, my my husband had a friend when he was growing up who, when he was, I don't know, maybe about five or six, um, was in the backyard and pushed his little sister into the pond in the back. And I don't think it was very deep. The, her parents were there. They pulled her out. She was fine. He grew up to be a perfectly lovely person, you know. Um, yeah. Right, everything is fine, right? They, that, you know, they were not, they, they were a white family, they weren't Asian. Very little of this has anything to do with the book, except for the fact that there is a sister who ends up in the lake, right, with a very different outcome. And the way that I got from the real life seed of the story into the book was sort of thinking, well, how did the relationship between that brother and sister change once he had pushed her into the lake? Um, you know, if, if my sister pushed me into the lake, I think I would remind her of that pretty frequently, yeah. um, especially <laughs> when I needed, <laughs> exactly, especially when I needed something from her, I'm sure we would talk about that often. Um, you know, but I started to think, well, if someone did that, how would it affect the relationship between those two siblings? And then what if it was in this particular situation, what if this family was shaped differently, if the constellation of this family was arranged in a slightly different way, what if, for example, this family felt isolated in their community and they, because they were, you know, they were the only interracial family and these siblings had depended on each other? How would that change the scenario? And so immediately, you know, you start, you're sort of like one of those hobbyists who likes to tinker with old cars. You're like, well, what if I do this? Or what if I change this? What if I swap out the entire engine and I put in a different engine? What if I you know, cut the top off of the car? You know, and suddenly you've ended up with this Changing thing. off of the car, yes. Exactly. And, and so I think there's often a real life seed, but by the time the book is done, I, I find almost always that it's moved well away from it into a place that I didn't, I didn't even know that I was curious about. Um, it's really a process of exploration for me as a writer of trying to find out what is it that's obsessing me right now. So when you're beginning to write a novel, you don't know um, the end of the novel yourself? I don't know. I have an idea of where it might go, okay. but... It often doesn't go there at all. Um, I, I think about it as sort of like taking a road trip. You know, you've got a general destination in mind and maybe you've got a rough route. You know, I'm going to go on this highway and we'll stop for lunch and then we'll get there. <laughs> but along the way, you often find you're like, oh, that looks interesting. Oh, here's someone selling, you know, having a yard sale by the side of, let's just pull over and see what happens there. And then often you end up realizing you didn't actually want to go to that place in the first place. Your original destination was maybe not that interesting and you found something much more interesting along the way. Um, that's kind of how it happens to me a lot. Um, in the first draft, at least, okay. figuring out what it is that, the story is. I don't know. And it's as much of a mystery to me going in um, as I think it often is for a reader when you come to a book and, and turn to the first page. Absolutely. I think it's so fascinating listening to the process of how you create your stories. And does it does it kind of come like, do you get like a, a like an 
you know, when you're writing your stories, you sit down and say, okay, I need to think now of a character or does it just kind of come to you, I guess? You're like, in <laughs> it's, it's both, I think. Um, I usually know, I usually know that I've got a story when I, I keep thinking about something, when I keep coming back to it, um, you know, it's pictures like pestering you. <laughs> that's exactly what I was thinking. It's like, it just keeps kind of tapping you on the shoulder and it's like, have you forgotten about me? Have you, you know, by the way, still here, uh, you know, <laughs> you know going. Um, and, and for me, that's usually a sign that there's something in that story that's that's caught my attention and it usually means then that it's something that I have to think about because again it's something that I don't understand um it's a little bit funny to talk about writing a story and and say you know I'm writing because I don't understand this we usually think um of of writing as a way of expressing what you do understand right um I think when I was an undergraduate and we're you know you're writing your exams it's always like, show me, show me everything that you know about whatever this subject is. And you kind of throw everything out there to, to prove sort of like a capstone of like, see, it was in my brain and now I've taken it out and I've put it on the piece of paper for you. And it, at least in writing fiction, and again, in the writing the first draft for me, it's much more the opposite. It's sort of like, well, here's a dark corner I haven't explored. Let me go and nose around in there for a little bit. Um, I think, I think many, you know, most writers, every writer does it differently, but I think a lot of writers have, have more of an idea going in. And for me, it really is sort of figuring out like, oh, here's this person. I don't understand why they would have done X, Y, and Z. And then I start thinking, well, where did they come from? It's a little bit like talking to someone at a, at a cocktail party. You, you just chat and you say, oh, where do you, where do you live? What, what, what do you do? Oh, where did you grow up? Oh, did you like growing up there? Oh, you didn't like growing up there. Oh, why not? What did, what did you like about it? Oh, oh, so, you know, are you close with your parents? Oh, you're not close with your parents. Okay, well, what's, what's your mother like? And suddenly you're, <laughs> You know, those are always the most fascinating kind of gossipy conversations to have. And that's sort of how I approach a lot of my characters is getting down into this sort of maybe slightly mucky areas about what made them who they are and how they act. And so it's it's not it's not a very conscious thing, as you said, of, of sort of going, I need to think of a character who would do this. It's hard it's, to <laughs> it's, I. I, I know there are writers who do that, and I, I sort of wish I, I wish I was one of them because it seems like it would be much more efficient um, <laughs> to have a plan. But for me, it's it is a little bit more like latching onto someone at a party who seems interesting and a little weird and possibly slightly unhinged, <laughs> and then just kind of following them around and seeing what they do. <laughs> I, I'm just imagining you at a dinner party finding you know the kind of the quirkiest person or the characters <laughs> that you must talk to. <laughs> it is just a little bit actually how I am at parties. Um, I'm actually by nature a pretty shy person and so I'm generally the I generally migrate to a corner somewhere where I can kind of why well, I'm never in the middle and I don't like to be in the middle and I don't like it when everyone's paying attention to me so I'll just kind of drift <laughs> off the sidelines and kind of watch. And then, you know, when people come to talk to me one-on-one, -on -one, we chat and almost always, even the people that, you know, on the face of things seem perfectly ordinary, turn out to be really interesting and funny and smart. And you just have to kind of find out what it is about them that makes them tick. And then, you know, almost always, any any random person that you talk to turns out actually to be pretty fascinating and 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 a little bit weird in in the best possible way <laughs> the best people are weird yes <laughs> i've always thought so I, I think you're so right people's behaviors and how they approach the world can definitely be explained by um, their, if you just research their background and you know the experiences that they've had in their previous life it, you're you're definitely right everyone can be I think explained or what makes them tick. Yeah, it's sort of an endless well of fascination. It's just um, I think what makes me become a writer is not that I had a you know a message that I wanted to proclaim, but just that I'm interested in people and I'm just interested in how they relate to each other and how they act. Um, I'm just sort of endlessly fascinated with with just humans and people and and we're so weird and wonderful and I, I feel like that's 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 sort of my been my my main you know impetus as a writer is to just kind of write a little you know I think of most of my stories as little sort of like love poems to just how how weird people end up being a lot of the time. <laughs>
<laughs> no, um, you're definitely right about that. It's funny. Um, I'm surprised you say you're a shy person because you, you know, you seem such a people person and outgoing, and so that's that's definitely. Um, it is. I. I I mean, it's to people don't believe me because I because I like people, but it, it's odd to be um, both a shy person and an introvert who also likes people, yes. right? I, I like I like them, and I I love talking. You know, one on one, I can talk to people forever. What really makes me feel shy is when there's you know sort of a whole right. group of people mixing. But um, yeah, if, you know, for any people out there who feel shy. Um, know that you can, you know, you can do it. I've, I've had to sort of learn to do, do public speaking, um, th through the, you know, through, through the work that I do. And you did debating in high school, you were mentioning. I it. did, I debated in high school. And, and actually that was a huge training as well. Um, because you had to learn to stand up in front of a group, maybe not totally sure of what's, what you're going to say and kind of start talking and trust that your brain will start, you know, feeding words out to your mouth. <laughs> Hopefully it'll make some sense. Right? Um, but it was good practice. You just have to do that. You know, every tournament, you just get up and, you know, you, you make two or three speeches per round and you, then you do it again. And if you mess up, you've got to do it again in a couple of hours. So it's um, a skill though for like, public speaking. Obviously we have to practice quite a bit as well with law but I know sometimes especially when you're starting off or haven't done it for a while you stand up and you're kind of like what am I even saying right now <laughs> my brain is it is there's there's a moment I remember especially uh you know when I was debating where you you start going like okay words are definitely coming out of my mouth right now yeah. I'm not sure where they're coming from <laughs> so it's all right okay we're gonna follow this along and keep going you know especially in debating when I think part of it is is a lot of it is building up that muscle of trusting that you do know what you're saying, trusting right? <laughs> yeah, you're, you're trusting, you're, you're, you know, you're learning what you're saying, but you're trusting that your brain is going to keep up and you're trusting in a way yourself that you will, you'll know what to do and that you do have these thoughts and that you can find the words to put them out. Um, I think that debating and then also later on having teaching experience are sort of the biggest things that, um, I don't want to say help me overcome my shyness because I think I'm still a naturally shy person. So the pandemic in some ways has been great in that <laughs> interact with people. Um, but it was it was helpful in sort of learning like, oh, when I need to speak publicly, I can do it. Do right. It. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Having that confidence. Definitely. And um, so I was saying, how then did you go? So you did your MFA. How did you go from there to, um, you know, your first best-selling novel, Everything I Never Told You? <laughs> I, I like this question because um, it always, it from the outside, I think that kind of journey always seems quite quick, right? It's sort of like you do, we were talking earlier about, you know, the preparations that you feel like you need to do. So you go to, you go to university, then you get your master of fine arts degree, then you write the book and then you publish the book. And it sounds so orderly. Vicious, mechanical. Stops, stops on the train, right? You just get right. go four stops and then you get off. Yeah. Um, and, and the truth of course is that it's, it's much slower and messier and in the process, you never, you don't know whether your train is actually going in the direction that you want it to be going, right? Um, so I finish, I finished my MFA, and then I, I moved back to Boston, where I live, where I live now, where I, where I am now, um, and I started writing, but I also had, you know, I had bills to pay and things like that. So I was doing some freelance editing work, um, editing and proofreading, because that was something I had experience in, and I could. I could work it around my writing time and I could write, work my writing time. Publishing. Did you, did you, before your MFA, you worked in publishing, was it? Yeah, I worked in publishing. I worked in uh, at a textbook publisher. Um, and then I worked as a, as a proofreader. So I would get the giant math, science and business textbooks and I would have to go through and, and, and proofread all of them. But it's a, it's a useful skill. Um, so I, I started, you know, I was working as a proofreader and um, while, I was, while I was working on the draft of my first book and it took a really long time. Uh, I finished my MFA in 2006 and I didn't finish writing the first book um, until what was it? I guess it was in like 2012. So it was a it was a long wait, and I was doing other things, you know. And I, I had my son partway through that period, but there was definitely a period where I wasn't sure if I was ever going to finish this book, and I wasn't sure if I would ever if if it would ever be published. And so 
looking back now, it seems like, oh, this was the orderly progression, right? You know, you, you get the degree and then you work on the book for a while and you revise it and you find an agent and you submit it to publishers and, and then one of them will take it. And it, it's, it's helpful to me to look back now and remember that none of that was foreordained. And at the time, I was I was never sure if I was ever going to, you know, to finish anything. Um, and so a lot of it really is sort of finding ways to keep going. Um, you know, whatever you end up choosing to do, you don't know if you'll be successful. And there aren't always easy, you know, spottable signposts. Forward. Exactly. You don't you don't know. And so part of it is finding other ways to keep yourself going and other reasons to do the work other than I hope this book will be published one day. That might be the goal. But I had to kind of I had to make peace with the idea that I was writing it not just to be published, but that it was something that would matter to me, even if it never got published, that it was just something that I needed to work out for myself or that I needed to, to articulate for myself. Um, and shifting the focus to that, I think in some ways made it easier because they were, well, if it never goes, if it never, never finds a publisher or it gets published and no one ever reads it and it is immediately put into the wood chipper after printing, you know, straight from the printing press into the wood chipper. Um, <laughs> you, you, yeah. At <laughs> least, experience. exactly, like at least I've, I've figured something out. There's something here that I'm trying to figure out for myself. And so, that the process of to answer your actual question the process of how I got from you know finishing my degree to the first book was a lot of just kind of slowly chipping away at things um I you know I I found a writing group and we would keep each other going and part of what we would do was not just cheerlead for each other but also just kind of um remind each other why we were doing this 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 job, so to speak, the job that none of us were, you know, supporting ourselves by or anything like that. Why Mars wasn't in the route you went in the end. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, you know, and and to think about that, and I would, you know, I would write short stories and I would publish them along the way. I would meet other writers purely as a fan and just talk to them and become friends with them and learn a lot from them. And so I think along the way, a lot of it was just sort of kind of bootstrapping my way along. And I had I had a lot of help, but a lot of it is figuring out, you know, what what is it that you're trying to do in whatever you pick? And then just kind of doggedly setting your sights on that and, and you keep on kind of climbing towards that as best you can. Absolutely. Um, I think, yeah, no, and you, well, you clearly, your personal experience or I know your, your first attempt wasn't, uh, it was a best-selling novel that has won <laughs> so many awards. So that was, you know, I think the process was probably worth it, um, no matter you know how long or not straightforward it seemed at the time. Yeah, it's it, it's. I I feel very lucky because again, when the book came out first, um, it came out and it was it was a little debut novel and it was fine. And then at some point later in its life, you know, um, Amazon highlighted it and then people started to find it and it took off from there. But even the process of that first book which is remembered as this sort of instant bestseller, it, was, it wasn't really, you know, it came out in June and it wasn't until November that anybody actually really even started to buy it and read it. And, and it, it's sort of a useful thing to remember that I think you, you're always sort of having to think about like the long term because in the short term, you really don't know which direction you're going. It's only sort of in retrospect that you can see, oh, I was headed in this direction at all. And I think that's true, whatever, whichever field you're in, you have to kind of always think about the long term process and remember that where you are, you don't always know, you don't always know exactly where your feet are planted at that moment. Yes, absolutely. And you know, is it a nerve wracking process when you publish a book and you're waiting to see if it takes off or not? Or it, it is. It, it, it totally, truthfully, it is. Um, it's it's almost the opposite process of of writing a book because for me, writing a book is very internal. It's very much, you know, it's, it's probably clear from from you know what we've been talking about. It's very much thinking about what I'm trying to say or what it is that I'm thinking about, right? And, and to do that, a lot of times I have to kind of tune out the rest of the world. I have to kind of pretend that no one's gonna read this. In fact, I, I got myself through writing the first draft of my book by telling myself, probably you won't even finish this, but if you do, probably no one will ever read it. And that was, you know, that was reassuring in an odd way because it meant, it's like dancing when nobody's watching you, right? You, you you're not nervous about it anymore. Um, purely just enjoying 
like you know the process or you know, exactly you know. and and it it's it's very much a process of sort of like tuning out the outside world then when the book goes out into the world it's almost the opposite um you're suddenly facing outwards you're suddenly you know talking to everybody um you know people are asking you so what is what does the book mean or what are you trying to say and it's a process in some ways of almost being a critic of your own book and it it is nerve-wracking because um i think we writers are, I think, probably the least suited people to be critics of our own book. We know, we know all the working, you know, it's, it's a little bit like, you know, I don't understand how, like, if you're a pilot or a mechanic, and you know how an airplane works, I would be terrified to go up in an airplane, because you know, everything that could possibly go wrong when you're up in the air, right? It's a little bit like, like that experience is that I know how this book was put together. It's very hard for me to, to think about it as a whole, or to talk about it. Um, but it's also a very rewarding process. Honestly, honestly speaking, it is. It is. It, it it's it's one of the most sort of moving experiences that I've ever had to have someone who's read your book come to you and say, "This meant something to me," or "I saw myself in this book." Right? Whether you know literally or just figuratively, like I have this feeling resonated with me. Yeah, it's it's something your work definitely does you know and that's that's I thank you and that's that's it's a huge gift honestly because I think when you write a book you don't know if anyone's ever going to hear it um a little bit less like some of the other art forms where there is a, a a bit of performance involved right if you're a musician or if you're an actor there will be an audience that is part of making the work but for the writer you're you're generally writing in solitude and then you, it goes out into the world and you don't know if this you know speaking of space it's like the little signals you beam out you don't know if anyone will ever receive them and it is it is a truly humbling experience quite frankly to have one of those signals bounce back to you and then when you have one of the signals bounce back and somebody says oh i understood what you were saying and here's something, do you understand what I'm saying? I feel like it's this, it sounds so basic when you put it that way, but it feels very profound. And it is something that I feel extremely grateful to be able to get to do is to to, to share books with readers and then to talk with readers um, about them. Well, I think, you know, of course, your, your impeccable writing style and creative process um, are phenomenal of course contributed to your phenomenal success but I would say that it's of course the universality of your and um, the themes that you you know talk about in the book from race identity family this prominent you know feeling of otherness that is so clearly palpable in, palpable from your main characters and you know everything I never told you and little fires everywhere and um, what the feeling of otherness that again just referring back to the start that comes back would you say stems from your experience? Do you draw on your own experiences from childhood? I think so, yes. I think I, I draw on that feeling of, as I said, you know, feeling like you feel one way inside yourself, but then you recognize in certain moments that other people see you differently. And I think that's something that I experienced as an Asian American in places where there weren't very many Asian Americans. But I'm glad you talked about the universality because I think it is something that most of us feel. We don't always recognize it, but we do feel it. You feel it often, for example, if you are the only woman in a room, for example. I suppose men often feel it if they're the only man, but that, that seems to happen less often, right? Or, or really any number of things. I think like there are many times that most people feel like they're on the outside, right? And if you can sort of see the kinship between the ways that you felt that and then the ways that someone else might feel it because of a completely different reason, I feel like that's a connection that's really valuable. That's, I mean, that's that kind of empathy, I think, is sort of at the, the root of, of figuring out how to move through the world. And so I think you're exactly right that, I, you know, I draw on some of those experiences of feeling like I was an outsider, but I'm really glad if readers read them and go, well, I've, you know, I've never been the only person of my ethnicity in this place, but I have been the only person who did this. I have been the only person who was working class in a place where everybody else was sort of like upper middle class or professionals. Or I have been the only person who, you know, had, a, who, you know, who had a, a, a disability or who struggled with a mental illness or who felt insecure or whatever. I mean, it could be anything and, it, and it's often many things, 
right? And that's how it resonates with, you know, so many people because I think we all can identify moments in our lives when we felt different or out of place. Yeah, and that's, and I'm so glad you said that because that is one of the things that I, I hoped that, you know, I hope would come through in the book is that that sense, it doesn't, it doesn't have to come from something like race, but that same, you have a similar feeling, right? It's not, it's not that you have the same experience, but you can see the parallels between sort of how you feel and how someone else feels. And, you know, as we were saying at the beginning, I feel like that's one of the things that, that fiction can do really well is it can really ask you to sort of sit inside someone else's thoughts and feelings and imagine that. And when you leave the book, hopefully, you have a better understanding of both yourself and of what it might be like to be somebody else, right? Um, I think, you know, in the past few years, we've, we as a society in, in the world have been talking a lot about empathy and the need to, um, to have more of it. Uh, you know, I feel like it's, it's like a muscle that's, it's gone all flabby and we need to, you know, kind of need to, to exercise that empathy. Guys. <laughs> exactly. But I think it's true in that, you know, a lot of the, the things that we're struggling with, I think, are because people end up seeing other people as completely other foreign, nothing like us, right? Foreign, whether in the sense of literally from another country or foreign is just different from me, not like us, right? And the separation into the us and the them. And human and beings, if, I think we kind of fear that sometimes. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. I mean, I think fear is such a big part of it. And, and the more I think that we can kind of puncture holes in that membrane between this idea of an us and a them, the more that we can kind of see commonalities and the more I think that like we will, I, I just think that's so important to our humanity to not see people as completely alien and different and unreachable creatures, but that even if we have a different background or we come from a different place or we think different things, that there is something fundamentally similar between us. Um, I feel like that's something really important to hold on to, um, especially in in the times that we're living in now, where at least over here, I'm not sure how it is over over by you, but there's the sense that um, we're splitting more and more into little kind of isolated factions that don't talk to each other, and that the pandemic really ignites that or um, reinforces yeah. that absolutely. Yeah, because we don't we don't get to see each other and connect in sort of everyday ordinary ways. Um, it's it's much easier to feel like you know you're in your own kind of private little state, and people who are outside of it are living in a completely different universe. And I worry about that. Um, and so I hope I hope that as a, as a fiction writer, I can do a small part in reminding people that there is more world, you know, I'm thinking about, we were talking about before this call that you, you can see outside of the frame, right? Where there's the frame of what you see in your Zoom screen, but there's all these other things out here that do exist, even if you can't see them. Um, that feels really important to me, um, both as a writer, but also just as a, a, a person who lives in the world. No, I, I, I definitely, though, from the sense of your novels, you definitely, like, for example, Little Fires Everywhere, everywhere you come away from the novel and you really kind of think I, I find myself looking at you know like everyday people and asking maybe why is that you know lady a bit grumpy or why would she cut me off so short you know maybe yeah <laughs> and so I think that is something outstanding about your novel is you really do come away and start and as is so clear in your creative process you really start to think about people and what's behind the the facade or the the zoom screen in a way you know <laughs> For an example. yeah well, that is, that is the, I think, like, the, maybe the nicest compliment that a writer could hear, quite honestly. <laughs> I am, my computer is complaining about, I've got this light plugged into it, and it's complaining about how it wants to be plugged in. Um, can I take, I'm so sorry, can I take a moment and grab my plug and plug of it course, in? Of course, of course, take your time. All right, take I will be right back. Take your time. I don't know if all the if all the students will see this or if you'll cut the middle bit out. But if the people, if the <laughs> members of the society see it, look, it happens to everyone. Everyone's battery runs out at extremely inopportune moments. Yeah, and light those light sources though as well. They 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 really like. Joy I think it. that's what it is. I don't usually have the light on, but it's really gray out today. No. 
Where oh, am I going to plug this in? It's working lovely because the lighting's the lighting. Oh, lighting. good! I, it's so I, I. It's so great! It's so gray out that I felt like I needed to to you know plug it in. Now, where am I going to plug in my computer? Yeah. <laughs> Shall I unplug? It's always a dangerous process when you know you get the plug and you're kind of thinking, mm, if I plug this one out, and suddenly off. and suddenly you're in the dark, right? And you're like, oh, all right, we're charged up now. Okay. <laughs> so again, I'll leave it to you if you decide to cut that out. Totally fine. If you decide to leave it in, and and I feel like that everyone will be like, ah. Here we are. We're all being human together. This is exactly <laughs> life in the pandemic age where you're like, oh, computers run out of battery. Yeah. Uh, we should be all set now because now I'm running off of power. So <laughs> brilliant. Oh, sorry. <laughs> and we're back. <laughs> um, so I think my my next question um for you is um, you know in your in addition to racial i guess and cultural issues your novels also look at this issue of belongingness and identity in general you know in your novel and everything i never told you it is clear that there's you know an intergenerational conflict that feeds into the tragedy um, of the book like do you believe that our parents i guess shape and um, we are shaped by our parents and the pressures that they exert on us I think we are um not not necessarily consciously i don't think they're doing it on purpose but I think we can't help it. I think they can't help but um, sort of transfer some of their their anxieties and their fears, but also their hopes and their dreams onto us. And I think we can't help but shape ourselves by them. Either we want to, if we love our parents, we maybe we want to become them in some ways, and then in other ways, we want, right? In other ways, you go, oh, I don't, I don't want to do that. I'll tell you that I'm. I'm at the age now where both my sister and I are turning into both of our parents in completely different ways and not in the ways that we expected, right? But you you kind of can't help it. And, and you know, now that I'm a parent, I also sort of recognize that as soon as, you know, you start parenting a small person, you start imagining because you can't help it. You start going, oh, you're so good at building with those blocks. Oh, maybe you'll become an architect. And you start going, oh, I'm projecting so many things onto them. You know, I think you can't help it, but I think the key is always to sort of remember that you have an idea, but it may or may not be the idea that they have, right? Um, it's it's in a way, it's it's a little bit of, of sort of a humility that you have to keep of being like, this is my guess, but I might be completely wrong <laughs> about that. Um, but I think to go back to what we were saying earlier, I do think that, you know, the environments that we grow up in, um, they shape us, whether, whether we realize it or not, um, you know, the place that you grow up in, the, the people that you know, how you communicate, all of those things end up sort of shaping the person that you are, maybe not all of it, but it's, there's, there's always going to be some part of that that's, that's influencing you there, I think. Absolutely. I think, you know, there's a whole debate, nature and nurture, but it probably is such a, you know, it's a combination of the both and nurture Absolutely. is so, um, it has such an impact, you know, as I've known from my life and I can, you know, from listening to you has had on you and your writing as well. Absolutely. Um, so I guess I'm <laughs> saying I'm after uh, grilling you. So uh, on a lighter note, I suppose, um, you know, congratulations on your new novel. Our oh, Mother thank you. <laughs> Um, so that's very exciting. That's being published in October this year. Yes. Right? Yes. Okay. Um, have we any you know thing to look forward to or sneak peeks or? <laughs> I hope so. It's it's early days yet. So I'm hoping uh, I've just just finished doing the edits of it, and so um, I've been sort of locked in in this office actually with with the book. Um, uh, it's it's the story of a of a young boy. Uh, he's twelve, and he's looking for his long lost mother. He receives a, a message from her in the mail, this mysterious letter that kind of draws him out into the world to find her. And of course, the answer to finding her isn't just in the you know the clues, the detective hunt along the way, but in a lot of ways, remembering the time that they had together and the things that she passed on to him, and trying to understand who she is. So a lot of it is, I think there are similar themes to the ones that always obsess me that, that come up in my earlier books. These questions, like you said, about what, what we get from our parents, you know, what our parents pass on to us and then what things get lost in translation along the way, I guess, maybe, right? Um, things that we don't understand about our parents that we are trying 
trying to understand um, and, and maybe failing to understand. Um, the questions about sort of finding your place, because the boy at the center of this book is is mixed race. His, his mother is a Chinese American and his father is white. Um, figuring out also sort of about how to take the things that happen to you and transfer them out into the world. Is it, to put it in cliche terms, is it possible to make the world a better place? And how do you do that? How can one person actually do anything? Um, I think those are the questions that I keep coming back to. And so those are some of the questions that that hopefully the book will be raising for readers as well. Well, I look forward to reading it and as do yeah. many of our members. So thank you so much, Liz Ng. And thank you for being so patient. And once again, for, you know, coming here today, um, I have one last question for you. <laughs> and after, you know, your phenomenal success, um, very a fascinating life as we've heard, you know, in the past um, 40, 50 minutes, um, I guess, have you, you know, any words of wisdom to impart, impart to our members? Oh, gosh. Um, I guess the, the best words of wisdom I have, honestly, are I think try and find something in your life that feels important and essential to you. And just keep using that as sort of your your guiding star that you follow. Um, it, it doesn't always mean, for example, that you take, you know, the hobby that you love and you make that your career. I've been lucky to do that. And, and I I still sort of don't know exactly how that happened because there there's a tremendous amount of luck involved. But I think, even, <laughs> well, I think even, even if I hadn't managed to publish a book, even if the book hadn't been a success, I like to think that I would have kept writing anyway, because it's something that feels important to me. It feels integral to me. And it's a way that I find to make sense and meaning out of what happens in, you know, in the world and in my life. And I think if you can find whatever it is for you that does that, whether it is the arts, whether it is the work that you do, whether it is some kind of activity that brings you meaning and joy. I feel like making sure that you don't lose that is so important because it's, I think it's quite easy for that to get pressed out of you, you know, in the, especially in the pressure of saying like, well, I have to have a job, I have to have a career, I have to, there are bills to pay, you know, these are real things. Um, but I think to kind of keep a little, little little tether to those things that make you feel like yourself and that make you feel like this is part of you know part of your being whatever it ends up being if it is you know playing music if it is you know sometimes it's people particular people that you you can count on to kind of ground you and help you figure out how to align yourself um, I use the metaphor of it being your guiding star but I think it's a good one which is that if you know that's the direction you're headed in you can figure out Everything which way you're turned right you can you might go oh I'm completely turned around because I need to go that way um I think especially when you're starting off you know in your career and in your adult life it's very easy to lose sight of that and it's something that I think I, I wish I had been reminded of at that age to go actually it's it's okay for you to have that thing in your life and remember that and don't lose that because that seems important um so that's, I guess that's the best advice that I have. Well, that's brilliant. I'm, I'm remembering every word here. <laughs> no, I, I really mean it. And um, thank you so much, Ms. Ng, for your time. And, you know, undoubtedly, it can't be disputed. You've made such an indelible impact um, on writing and on people's lives as a whole through the issues that you discuss in your book. And um, so I thank you on behalf of um, our members, um, not only for your time, but for your writing and for all that of you all, all that you have contributed. Well, thank you so much. It's truly an honor and also just a genuine delight to be here. So thank you so much. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Jose. I won't take any more of your time. Um, and again, if you're in Dublin at any stage, <laughs> please, please do give an email. And we absolutely to will. The Book of Kells tour. <laughs> <laughs> I absolutely will. I will get to see the Book of Kells one we'll, day. We'll skip the queue this time. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be wonderful. Ruth, Ruth, Ruth's got good contacts. <laughs> so good. I will, I will take you up on that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you very Thanks, much. Thanks, you too.